I am Charlie Winburn, your life coach with Renew Community Church right here in the city of Cincinnati. And I wish above all things that you prosper and be in good health even as your soul prospers. Did you know that you are both human and divine and that you deserve to live a better life in Christ right here on earth? Our messages are practical, they are raw, they are fun, and they are focused on real issues as it relates to your spiritual life, health life, your mental life, your financial life, your relationship life, and even your business life and community life. Today, we have another real life application message designed especially for you and your family. Remember, before we get started today, you can learn more about Renew Community Church Free Life Coaching by visiting our website, renewcommunitychurch.org, or you can listen to us every Sunday at 11.45 a.m. each Sunday on YouTube, Renew Community Church live stream, or reach me at 513-884-7832. I want you to join me now for another life-changing message with Charlie Winburn, your life coach, right here in the city of Cincinnati, Cincinnati, Ohio. Good morning, good morning, Renewed Community Church family. What a beautiful day to be happy in the Lord. I am Brother Dan, also known as Sarge. Won't you get ready today for a great message coming up shortly from Coach Winburn. Today's message is entitled, Learn How to Break Victimhood So You Can Be Happy. Yeah, learn how to break victimhood so you can be happy. You will learn today how to break being a victim so you can be happy. You're going to learn how you can be happy today. So get ready, get your coffee, get your, your drink, get whatever you need. Coach Winburn will be up shortly with a great message entitled, Learn How to Break Victimhood So You Can Be Happy Today. Again, welcome to Sunday Morning Masterclass, designed with you in mind. Why don't you um, share with us today, on uh, get with us today on Facebook and YouTube. We would like for you to watch us and share the message today. As you're watching today, make comments, um, share the link with someone. Someone that you know that may need to learn how to break the victimhood so that they can be happy. Share with your friends. Tell your neighbor. Let everyone know that Renewed Community Church is live on Facebook and YouTube. As you know, our master class is is built on biblical principles coupled with basic science so you can live a better and divine and and human life here on earth. It is not church as usual, as you know. It is, it is designed to help people do like our foundational scripture, which is Romans 12, 2. Don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that is a continuous thing, renewing our mind. We just don't renew our mind once, one time. We have to do that on a regular and continuous basis, renewing our mind. It takes approximately 60 seconds for the invisible laws of attraction to fully jumpstart or activate your life based on whatever you focus on, whether that's good or bad. The laws of attraction is always reading and matching your vibrations, your emotions, your feelings, and your energy. The 31 day focus life story calendar. Today, is April the 15th, April the 14th, and today's um, says, April the 14th says, I mean, yeah, April the 14th, it is my divine and human right to be harmonious today. It is my divine and human right to be harmonious today. And we'd like to do the next day, which is Monday the 15th, it is my divine and human right to walk in courage today. So it is your divine and human right to be harmonious today, and it is your, div- it is your divine and human right to walk in courage today. So will you walk in courage today? Will you walk in courage today? It takes approximately 21 days to get rid of the negative vibrations. 
but in 31 days you would have created for yourself a positive, life-changing, and emotional vibration. If you just tell one story each day, three times a day, up to 60 seconds each day for 31 days, you can see a big difference in your life. All right, so I'd like to do the re recap of some of the things that Coach Winburn talked about last week. You know, last week's um, message was entitled, um, it was titled, Relationships Making You Sick, Break Trauma Bonds and Pain Body Triggers. Breaking Trauma Bonds and Pain Body Triggers. What are trauma bonds? Trauma bonds are intense emotional networks that that form between victim and the abuser. Trauma bonds are a negative attachment that develop in abusive relationships, causing the victim to feel a strong connection to the abusers. Trauma bonds are negative psychological connections that form between individuals who have experienced a co-creation of trauma together, often leading to co-dependency. Trauma bonds do not have to be in an abusive relationship. You don't have to be in an abusive relationship to have trauma bonds. 80% of trauma bonds that you get from someone did not start off as, a, as, abuse, as an abusive relationship with them, but over the course of time, it becomes an abusive relationship. Coach talked about some examples of trauma bonds. Here are some examples of some trauma bonds. A survivor of domestic violence feels strong, feels a strong negative attachment to their abuser, to, a, to the abusive partner, um, despite the harm they have endured believing that the abuser truly likes them. We can, relate, we can all relate to that or can know someone in a, maybe in a situation like this. Another one, a child who has been emotionally, emotionally neglected by their father or by their mother continues to seek their approval and attention, even though the parent is often indifferent or dismissive. Another one is a person who has experienced repeated betrayal or manipulation by a friend or romantic partner. They struggle to break free from the toxic relationship, feeling a deep sense of attachment and loyalty to the abuser. But he also talked, Coach talked about ways to break free from trauma bonds. Yes, there are some ways that you can actually break free from, from the trauma bonds. And the first thing he talked about is, is to acknowledge, be honest and truthful with yourself. Acknowledge the trauma. Then you want to seek therapy. Then you want to set boundaries so that it doesn't continue to happen in your life. Then you want to build a support network. You want to practice self-care. And then just educate yourself. And also, you have to challenge your beliefs. You got to challenge your emotions. And you got to challenge your memory. And then you got to create a new routine for yourself. Get out of the old and get your new. And you have to create a new routine for yourself. And then you want to practice mindfulness. And then just take one step at a time. You want to start over by taking one step at a time. Coach talked about the pain body. Pain body. When you don't address your child trauma, your trauma bond um, will explode inside of your body. If you're not if you don't address um, that trauma, that trauma bond will explode inside of you. It'll explode in your kidneys. 
It could explode in your lungs, your prostate, could be your eyes, your ears, somewhere. If you don't address it, it can explode inside of your body, causing issue, other issues inside of your body. And you don't want that. Pain bodies. Pain bodies is a, it is a collection of past emotional wounds or trauma that never get healed. Pain body is a collection of past emotional wounds or trauma that never get healed. It consists of unresolved childhood emotional trauma from the past that has never been fully processed or healed. The pain body is activated by present situa situ situations that reflect pain, past pain. The pain body is activated by present situations that reflect past pain that you've had. Also, the pain body thrives on negative emotion. Yeah, it's get, it, get it, it gets its energy from the negative emotions inside of you. The pain body also seeks validation through suffering. The pain body distorts perceptions and, re and re realities. The pain body can lead to destructive behaviors in your life. The pain body creates a sense of separateness in your life. But there are some benefits of addressing the pain body triggers. Coach talked about some of the benefits that you can get simply by addressing some of the pain body triggers. And some of the um, improvements and um, benefits would be you get, you get improved mental health. So your health will get better. Increase self-awareness. Enhance relationships. Your relationships seem to get better. Better coping mechanism. Increase self-esteem. And you get improved physical health. He also talked about ways to break pain body triggers. Yeah, there are some ways that you can break the pain body triggers. And again, simple things that we can do. Practice mindfulness is, w is one. Cultivate self-awareness is number two. Number three is practice self-compassion. And number four is practice accept acceptance. And number five, practice forgiveness. That's a, hard, that's a hard one for us to practice forgiveness. It's hard for us sometimes to forgive. We don't even want to forgive ourselves. And it's hard sometimes to forgive others. But we can do it. Practice deep, deep breathing. And these are just some ways to break um, pain body triggers. Um, practice deep breathing. And also practice um, meditation. Coach also talked about the, the emotional code. And what is the emotional code? It's trapped emotions. Trapped emotions are negative emotional energies that become trapped within the body, disrupting the pain of energy and potentially leading to the physical and emotional issues. The definition of trapped emotions is unpro unprocessed emotions. Now, this occurs when a person experiences a strong emotion but, uh, but does not fully process or release it. And all the emotions become trapped within. Unprocessed emotions. Another one is um, subconscious emotional imprint. These are trapped emotions can be taught, can be thought of as a subconscious emotional imprint left behind by past experiences or trauma. Emotional baggage. This is trapped emotions can be linked to emotional baggage that a person carries with them from past experiences. This, another one is energetic residue. This is trapped emotions left behind, energetic residue within the body. This residue can contribute to feelings of stress, 
anxiety, and other emotional and physical um, complications. Another one is energetic blockages. And these are trapped emotions can create energetic blockages within the body's energy system. This blockage can disrupt the natural flow of energy through your body. We don't want that. We want the, the, the natural flow to flow through our bodies. We don't want the any interruptions at all. So this last week was a great message on how we can break the trauma bonds and the, and the triggers. And with this, I would like to bring up Brother Chuck. All right, thanks a lot, Dan. Appreciate you. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is Chuck Futell. We want to have some fun today. If you, if you watched our message going forward, you know what my job is in the beginning. I want to give you instructions on how to get our message out, have more people get engaged with what we're doing here at Renew Community Church. So first thing I'd like you to do, please, sir, please, ma'am, if you're online with us, what we'd like you to do is to... Um, we, what we'd like for you to do is to go ahead and share our message. Go ahead and share it, whether you're on Facebook, whether you're on YouTube. Please, sir, please, ma'am, share our message. We want to get double-digit shares up. Double-digit shares, what it does is it creates a scenario where people all over the United States, all over the world, end up watching our message. You may not know this, but we have people from other parts of the world that pop in and listen. From time to time, we have people in Mexico end up watching us. We have people... And the Caribbeans end up watching us. And so from time to time, we have people watching us. But the reason why they get connected is through what? By sharing. And what happens is there's an algorithm that runs inside of Facebook. And the more people watch, they bring it to you. Does that make sense? They're actually working the law of attraction in Facebook. Y'all don't understand the words coming out of my mouth, but that's how the whole system works. And the more people watch, the more they give it to people. Does that make sense? So number one, we'd like for you to share. Share that message, and you can text it out. You can email them, whatever, whatever way you need to do. Please share that message, number one. Uh, number two, what we'd like for you to do is to like the message. You can go in, hit on the emoji, and go ahead and just uh, uh, do that, and that would be great for you to do because, once again, that brings our numbers up in the technology, so you can do that on Facebook. You also do it on YouTube. Uh, the next thing I'd like for you to do is to make comments. If you make comments as we go along, it does two things. Number one, it helps you, and it helps everybody else in the community uh, of Renew Community Church. So when, when you make a comment, you make a comment of something that caught your attention, something that was important to you. You put it in there on Facebook and YouTube. But then also what happens is it helps the community because maybe somebody didn't get it the same way. You got it. You can share it in such a way that you can help them improve. So we'd like, love for you to go ahead and message that. And then what it does is it, it makes it easy for us because we recognize people that do what? Uh, uh, make comments. So <laughs> Coach, he's, he's calling people out that have made comments. So we track that. We want to make sure that people are engaged. In fact, the best way to learn is to be engaged in the process. Show me someone that's sitting in an environment, a learning environment, they're not paying attention, guess what? I don't care how smart they are. They're not going to get the message. So you have to engage into the message in order to get the message. So um, what, what are we all about today? What we're about today is that today's message is how do you break victimhood so you can be happy? Coach Winburn is going to talk about that. Uh, he's also, uh, do you play the victim? Learn how to end victimhood. So the whole goal is learning how to end victimhood. Uh, um, so what is this all about? What is Master Your Mind all about? It's good to see you, Linda. It's been years since I've seen you. In fact, you got a reputation that's, that's uh, all out in the community, which is good. Great, a great, great thing. So um, <laughs> Linda Matthews is here in the house, so we want to acknowledge her. Um, so in any event, here, here's what this whole Master Your Mind class is built on. 
It's built on biblical principles coupled with basic science. You might see me, believe it or not, this is the thing that's always been attractive to me. I have a high science degree. I can actually, and most people don't know how to do this, you can actually calculate the expansion of the universe. You can calculate the expansion of the universe. All you have to do is take the third law of entropy and, and equal it to Einstein's theory of, of relativity, and then you solve for time. I had to do that in college. <laughs> Y'all, <laughs> yes, this is a religious service. <laughs> So we might get into something that's, that's Mary, maybe theoretical, something that might be dealing with, with chemistry, uh, biology, physics, psychology. We're going to tap into all those different realms. Why? Because this is higher learning. We're going to tap into higher learning. We, we ain't going to tap into lower learning. We ain't going to repeat things that don't even work anymore. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Somebody said, thank you, Jesus. We ain't doing that. That's, that's not what we do here. So this is called master your mind. It, it, in, in couple, it, it, it takes biblical principles coupled with science so that we can live a better divine and human life on this planet Earth. Here's what, this is what this is not. Uh, the Master Your Mind class is not a religious service. We don't, we don't have a choir up in here that, you know, <laughs> we don't have a baptism up under here. There's not a baptism uh, thing up under here. We don't, we don't have any of that. Uh, we don't have a Sunday school class where we take, where we go in and we do uh, uh, Joshua chapter 8 this week. And then next week we do ja Joshua chapter 9. We, we don't do that here. Now, should you know that? Oh, absolutely. Joshua's one of my favorite characters in the Bible. We, we can get down on Joshua, but that's not here. We're not doing that here. This is not church as usual. We might use some colloquial language. Did I say that right, Professor? I, I, and it's close. I'm, I'm trying to be sophisticated. I'm trying to bring my, my level up. I'm trying to be sophisticated. I'm, I'm trying to learn some new vocabulary words, <laughs> all that kind of jazz. So what we want to do is we want to <laughs> bring people up. Does that make sense? Y'all laughing. That's the truth. No, it really is the truth. In fact, no, 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 let's, let's be real clear. It's okay for us to challenge stuff. No, I'm, I'm serious. I wouldn't be in the place I'm in right now if I didn't challenge my environment around me, the thinking that was around me. I think it's comical to me that uh, I'm on this board and they wanted me to write a letter to this financial institution. You understand, when I was in school, I didn't even know it, uh, Linda, I was dyslexic, and I was in an all-white school and they used to have me come up and try to read, and I couldn't read, and then I got all the negative. I got all this. My childhood trauma came from my kids, and they would call me the N-word, and I'm so dumb and stupid and stuff like that. I had to overcome that. A and so as a result, uh, as a result, that negative, if you will, forced me to get better in that area. Does that make sense? I could accept it as my, as my weight in life. I'm always going to be slow. I'm always going to read slow. I'm always going to be kind of getting bad grades and stupid. I wasn't going to accept. I was, no, I was not going to accept that. And so I learned how to work through some things that were holding me back. Here's the other thing you're going to get. This is something other, other churches don't do. Now, listen here. This is something even business people don't do. You're going to get a free ebook and a toolkit from today's message emailed to you. If we got your email, we're going to send you the goodies. You're going to get the goodies. We're going to send the goodies to you. We send them every week for the people that are connected here. Listen here. Yesterday, we were at the Black Male Summit. 
It was conducted at the University of, of Cincinnati Carl Linder's Business School, School of Business. It was in the big auditorium, and we had all these people in here. I mean, we had, we had, in fact, all the almost all the speakers were doctors. I mean, almost everybody was doctors in there. I mean, all these people, all these. So we had uh, um, all these knowledge people, basically talking to black males at this at this meeting. There were people. There were college students there because we wanted college students to get in and learn and be around folks like me and Winburn and all these guys. They we wanted some young people around. I had my son come, uh, one of my business partners come. We had people, a whole, you know, all, everything. Everything was, was represented in this room. And so guess what? None of the speakers gave out their material. Because you are listening today, at Master Your Mind class, you're going to get the notes that Coach Winburn spoke on at that event. He was the keynote speaker. In other words, he, the, we had a greeting, the African greeting that came through. We had a brother do the African greeting. Uh, um, coach came in, and then he ended up closing the meeting. So we had a, a whole, it was a whole day event. They fed us. Uh, everything was a great event. And then on the back end, he closed it out. So it was all day event, great knowledge. You're going to get that today. Don't, don't, don't that make you feel good? You could break dance. That's good. You were able to get this information. And so in this event, Coach Winburn, Coach Winburn kind of is really interesting. What he did is he kind of synthesized a lot of the stuff he's been teaching here and shared it with that mass. In fact, people came up to Coach. They said, Coach, uh, Coach Winburn, you help me out. I'm a I'm, I'm going to actually talk about some of these issues, but you made it easier for me to do my presentation because you, what you did is you plowed the way for me to be able to introduce these ideas to these, these uh, brothers here in this meeting. So that's what you're going to get being here today and being a part of this. So this is all good. I'm going to start with uh, one last piece. Master Your Mind class is designed to help people just like you people who love God, but they've given up on church as usual. So that's the type of person that's really attracted to this type of ministry. And, and what we believe is that this, this is the foundational scripture for our church. It's Romans 12 and 2, and it says, and be, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. That's what this thing's all about, renewing of your mind. And so what we're going to do is, uh, like I said, we got this plus. Now, as I was thinking today, what am I going to say? What am I going to do? Actually, what I want to do is I want to give tribute to Coach Charlie Winburn. I want to give a tribute because this is the best. This is actually the best tribute that I can give him. When I came back from Ghana, I gave him a uh, I bought him an a, a, a African robe to wear from Ghana. But, you know, in a bracelet. That's just stuff, right? When y'all agree, that's just stuff. So I wanted to let him know that I wanted to honor him, right, with what I brought him. But I'm going to do the greatest honor I can give him. What I'm going to do is distill the things that I learned. And actually, he was learning over the past 10 years as we were going through, because we were, we were tumbling <laughs> through life during these things in the past 10 years. So let me share with you some things that we learned. When I first got involved at Renew Community Church, we started the church talking about one of my favorite subjects, which is leadership. And in the topic of leadership, <laughs> he, was, he was on that same vein at the same time I was on that same vein. He felt like I felt that in order to move forward, whether you're in business, whether you're uh, in a church, people need to become better leaders. And so in that vein, what we did was we reached out to actually one of Coach Winburn's friends, um, the late Samuel Lynch. And Samuel Lynch ended up, he worked for a company, an, an international company 
international company that basically taught leadership all over the world. It was called Global Lead. And so they were all over the world talking to people about leadership. He actually was a member here until his passing, and he actually taught the leadership principles that they charge these corporations tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars, contracts. He came in here and taught us that. Can you say, wow? We, we sat there at the feet of Coach Winburn and Sam Lynch, and we were learning leadership techniques and principles that I use even to this day. Because once again, I sat here and I learned my lesson. The next thing that we learned is we learned something that's called whole brain theology. Whole brain theology is huge. In fact, Coach Winburn went and got certified to be a trainer and a teacher in whole brain training because it was so important and because of its impact and because of what you can do with it. He, he actually did whole brain training. I'm not going to get into it because it's a deep study in and of itself, but basically it, 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 it looks at the mind and says that there's four different quadrants, if you will, in terms of how people think. And we're all a combination of these four different quadrants. So uh, some people are what's called a right brain biased, where they have a high right brain bias. They, they are big picture thinkers, and there are compassionate, emotional people. There's other people that have a left brain bias. Somebody's laughing because I tell them all the time they got a high right brain bias here. And the great wolf has a high right brain bias. I'm on the other end. I have a high left brain bias. Left brain bias are people that they, they read data, they look at data and facts, and then they have to have a plan. They, they <laughs> these people organize, high organized people. And so it was really interesting. I never knew this thing existed. I knew I was different than other people. I knew that. And so what happens is, here's what it, here's what it taught me. Instead of being critical of people that think differently, you have to learn how to understand what they see and also leverage what they see. Y'all need to hear me. You need to learn how to leverage people who are different in how they react to you. So let me give you an example. I know because I have left brain dominance, in my business, I have to lean on the people on my team that have what? Right brain dominance. If I'm doing something that's out in the public, I need to make sure that it's whole brain where it will attract everybody, whether they're left brain preference or right brain preference. Does that make sense? You have to, in fact, in your communication, you have to add both uh, parts of right brain as well as left brain in order to communicate effectively. If you look at the great teachers and, and preachers of the world, Martin Luther King he spoke in whole brain. Jesus Christ spoke in whole brain. That's why everybody got where he was coming from. See, you have to be able to communicate. If you're going to communicate, if you're a leader, you're going to have to communicate in such a way that everybody can pick up on what you're saying. The next one I learned is what's called emotional intelligence. I, was, I had already picked that up, but emotional intelligence, here's what it says. Emotional intelligence says that we're in an age right now. I came in the age where IQ was important. The score that you got on the SAT was important. <laughs> Did you, you, you were able to go to college based on your SAT score. Now, here's a really interesting thing. When you look at business owners, business owners actually had low SAT scores. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> but what they had was something that the people that with high IQ, they what they had was 
they had what's called emotional intelligence. Here's what it equals out to. If you don't have a high level of emotional intelligence, I can tell you, number one, you don't earn much money. People with low levels of emotional intelligence are low income earners. They are low income earners. If you have low emotional intelligence, you are a low income earner, guess what? You struggle with people, you wrestle with people, you argue with people, why? Because you're not sensing, you're, first of all, you don't see yourself, you don't sense yourself, and you don't sense the environment, you don't sense the people around you. So if you're missing those pieces, then guess what? You're struggling in life. And so when you look at these high earner people, they have high emotional intelligence. And I'm not saying all of them, because obviously Steve Jobs was a genius, right? He was a very smart guy. He was in MIT. But he not only had IQ, but he also had EQ. That made him dangerous, very powerful. He had both. No, he had both. And so that made him very powerful. He can get with the, he can get with the, the brainiacs, the, le the left brain people, but then he can do emotional intelligence. So he was very powerful. I'm just teaching, and this is the stuff that I learned here. I challenge you to stay in the game and get some info up under your afro, as Coach Winburn says it, right? Get some info. The next thing I learned, we learned this actually, we kind of knew it, but we stepped on, we stepped on a landmine. You won't believe this. We stepped on a landmine, and this is how we found out about adverse childhood experience. Yes, we were talking about it, but we didn't have the words. We were talking about it, but we didn't have the words. Here's how it happened. We did, we did a number of studies where we were determining, because Coach Winburn had seen uh, in, in, the, in the spirit, he just seen a great falling away from people from the church. And so what we did is we did research studies. We talked to the brightest people in the nation about this great falling away. We did studies here. We, we took young people. We took white folks, black folks, young, old, church people, not so church people. You, I, we, did every, we looked at everything, and we have the data on all that stuff. Here's what we found out. Hey, cuz, what we found out is that the reason why people were falling away from church was church was not meeting their needs. And what we realized is what we had to do is we had to go all, we had to go biblical on folks. We, we had to, no. We had to go gangster biblical on people. We had to do what Jesus did. Ain't that novel? Boy, ain't that novel. So what did Jesus do? He was walking around talking to the people. And if they had a need, he helped them with their need. What most churches do, they want to, you, you need to be saved. You need to be baptized. That's not what Jesus did. If they was hungry, he fed them. If they were sick, he healed them. If he was poor, he gave them substance. So we were doing this, and what we would do, we would start, coach would have a thought or an idea. He would run into this thought or idea for about 30 minutes, and then he asked questions. And what happened was uh, uh, it became the pain, if you will. When we started touching the pain of the people, what they started doing, it was, it was too much for us. We, weren't, we didn't have the skill to really help the people. When we, when we uncovered the hurt and the pain that people were having, I mean, people came up, they were crying and screeching and all this stuff. And what happened was we had this, we had this uh, psychologist that happened to come to our meeting, and, they, and this psychologist said, what you need to do, these people are struggling with adverse childhood experience. We actually, by accident, stand, stepped on the landmine. Then it became obvious we had been working in that space for a long time. We just didn't have the words. We just didn't have the words. We didn't have the test. We didn't know there was an actual scientific clinical test out there with childhood adverse experience. Because of that, it helped me to do what? It helped me to look at, because Winburn talked last week about all of his hurts. It helped me to look at my hurts. I gave you one of them about how I was abused in school by 
the nuns, the priests, and my, the, the, the kids that were in school with me, the other students. I wouldn't hurt at my home. I got hurt when I went to school. <laughs> so I had, to, I had to deal with that because guess what? That left some scars in terms of how I learned. It, it left some scars in terms of how I saw white folks because my abuser were white kids, uh, white priests, and white nuns. So I had this, I had this chip on my shoulder about white folks. Y'all got it? I had to get past those negative feelings. Now, the good part is I had gotten past most of that by the time I got here. Not all of them. I got past most of them by the time I got here. So when we saw it and we knew there was a test and we took the test, oh, my God, it opened up some doors. I had to go to my children, and, I, and I, just like Winberg said, I had to say, I got all of them, took, took them to dinner at a separate time. I said, I want you to forgive me. For what? For how I raised you and the mistakes I made. Now, they, they didn't acknowledge it. It's like, Dad, y'all the best parents. <laughs> um, but anyway, no, no, no. We screwed up. We just did the best we could with what we knew. We, we worked really hard to do the best we could with what we knew, but we were short. Knowing what I know right now, I would do it differently. Can't go back. The next one, let me give you number five. Coach Winburn is actually a high right brain person. I have never, <laughs> I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say this across the universe. Until Coach Winburn, I've never had a right brain person as my friend. <laughs> never. Never, because in my mind, I thought they were crazy. <laughs> they, they, <laughs> no, seriously, because they change their minds regularly. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I'm serious, y'all laughing. I, I had this young lady, one, this lady was beautiful on campus, and she was right brain. And so today she went with me, a week later, she didn't want me no more. <laughs> and so I, I just wasn't ready for right brain. Does that make sense? I mean, I just thought, I just thought they were crazy. I, I really did because I, I was the kind of guy, um, praise God I'm not like this way. Uh, uh, if I was a gangster, I'd be hard to deal with, Dan. No, I'm serious, because I'm so focused. If I say I'm going to do something, it gets done. <laughs> if I say I'm going to do something, it's going to get done. So if I was a gangster, if I say you're going to die, they, that person would be dead. You know what I'm saying? There you know <laughs> ain't, ain't a lot of room for negotiation. <laughs> uh, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, it's so, so anyway... So, so, <laughs> Coach Winburn, you didn't know this. You're my first right brain, brain friend. <laughs> you have helped me to understand that it's okay. <laughs> you're, you're not crazy. Actually, he's actually pretty smart. <laughs> ah. But here's what I learned. Now, here's what I learned. Now, I'm playing. I'm having fun. I'm getting everybody excited because Coach Winburn is going to be here, and he's going to defend himself and probably give me a couple of shots and stuff like that. He'll say that I'm his first <laughs> left brain friend ever. <laughs> but here's, here's, what, here's what it did. Here's what it did. Coach Winburn has an uncanny ability. In fact, when we measured, measured him on the charts, out of all the people that Sam Lynch had tested, I think he was Coach Winburn's like number two in being – over the chart, high yellow is, is, I mean, creative. He's a high creative genius, high big picture. I mean, I mean, he's way over the top. Now, the reason why our relationship is very good because I do some stuff that he doesn't do as well. Does that make sense? So I, I so he has to always come back. Well, what's the facts, Chuck? So I have to, I have to, we have to bounce off each other, but we make a good partnership. You got the black bishop and you got the white bishop. 
between the two bishops, we cut the whole room up, okay? <laughs> he slide down one place, and I'm coming the opposite direction, cleaning up the other. Does that make sense? So you got to learn how to do that. But he's taught me how to be a bigger, big-picture thinker. How does that play out? When the pandemic hit, we were in trouble. Let me be very honest. We were in trouble. There were some things that I had privy to that most people did not know. When the pandemic hit, we had to make a move. If we wouldn't have made the move, this ministry would not be alive today. Y'all need to hear me. It would not be alive today. So what happened is we had to, Coach Winburn and I had to work together. I had to be open to say, is there a way? I couldn't close down and be very limited and say, what does the data say? What does the process say? I had to think big picture. I had to go big picture, and I started searching big picture, and we came up with a solution. Amen? So in that process, and there are some things, and all of this is plus and minus, because prior to this, there was no way in the world Coach Winburn would do Facebook. We tried to get him on Facebook for years. Uh, well, let's go for years. He said, no, 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 I ain't going to do that. <laughs> so, so what happened is God's had his hand on this ministry. And it's taught us as we're going along. See, we wouldn't be getting this goodie, all these goodies, if it wasn't for God. Y'all didn't hear what I just said. We would not be getting these goodies if it was not for God. So the big picture thinking made a difference in terms of this ministry. And then also, guess what? The same thing was happening in my business. I was in a business where for 45 years, our company was based on, I go to your house, develop a client, or you come to my office. The pandemic hit. You got a multi-billion dollar company scratching his head saying, what should we do? Think about that. A multi-billion, international company, United States and Canada, we're scratching our heads saying, what should we do? But we found a way. We found a way we were able to get on Zoom, and when we jumped on Zoom, our profits increased 25%. Look at God. Big picture thinking. The next one. Here's the next one, number six. This is huge. This is huge, folks. 90% of the people on this planet Earth do not know what they want. Let me say it again. 90% of the people on the planet Earth do not know what they want. As a result... The spirit realm in the universe gives you what you don't want. See, it defaults to what you don't want. So either you have to press the button and tell uh, the, the spirit realm what you want, align that with your humanity, and work together, or either you get the default, which is what you don't want. Most people live in a world of what they don't want. They're frustrated in their health. They're mental, they're spiritual, they're financial, they're family. They're frustrated. Why? Because they never, they never told anybody what they want. If you look at your life, you can go ahead and rewrite your life by answering that question. What do you want? Number seven. Because of who I am, because I tend to be a little bit left brain, this piece that Coach Winburn does very well is called charisma. Y'all don't notice this, but he does something very well. It's called charisma. It's on display when he gets up here. Now, normally, uh, he's probably quiet, introvert type person. He don't have anybody around him. But when he gets on the stage, <laughs> he gets turned up. <laughs> oh, better you know this. How long have you been around, Coach? Over 25-year Dr. Ovetta, 
who is on the board here for the church. She's been around him for a long time. She's one of the trusted advisors here. She's been around him for 25 years, and she knows normally she just talks to him as an old person, put him in front of, get him a mic on, the spotlight's on him. Oh, man. <laughs> so I had to learn that because that helps. You understand? When you're presented, that helps. Number eight, coaches here, I'll speed it up. Marketing and advertising. Coach Winburn, actually I told him, I said, Coach, why did you get in politics, man? You actually should have been in marketing and advertising. You could have a multi-million dollar advertising agency because he has his way of marketing. We Actually, we get it all the time. All these cards, he's creating these cards every week. You understand that most businesses pay hundreds of thousands of dollars a week to create marketing. He does this off the top of his head. He does this stuff all the time. He, j he just got a, a sense of how to connect with people, the heart of people. And so uh, 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 just being around him, I've become better at what? Marketing and advertising. When the pandemic hit, we started a, a, uh, um, a webinar series every week, and it's run since the pandemic even to now, where we teach people financial literacy and money. money. It started in Ohio. We only have people in Ohio and Kentucky listening. If you come on today, there's at least five states minimum. Anytime you come on, don't, don't make a difference what the sub subject is. And then if, if it's a subject a lot of people like, it's like 10 or 12 states. Number nine. Last week he talked about, he's talked about this several times, falsehood versus truth. 75, no, 15% of the people operate in truth. 85% of the people operate in falsehood. What does that look like? Here's what it looks like. <laughs> Somebody said, mm. So what that means is, is that if you're in a room, if you're in a normal room, an average, you know, just a normal setting, what that means is out of every 10 people, eight of them are going to lie to you. I'm serious. That's a, that's a fact, Jack. They're going to lie to you. And so you don't need, no, listen here. You don't need to get your blood pressure up. You don't need to get excited. You, listen here, if somebody tells you what they do, what they're going to do, listen here. You ain't got to listen to that. All you have to do is watch what they do. That's the secret. Just wait. Because if you watch what they do, that's the answer to what they're thinking. Amen? Could I get an amen? This is some, this is some deep code. Listen here. A the couple of these things, I wish I knew this 30 years ago. I mean, really. Because I run a business, people could tell, come to me all the time. They'd be lying, lying, lying. And I'm so naive, <laughs> Linda. I thought they were telling me the truth. I thought, I thought people were like me. Stone cold killers. Whatever you say is good. <laughs> they ain't like that. <laughs> They're not like that. They ain't like that at all. I wish I, listen here, I, I, I done lost millions of dollars, <laughs> millions of dollars because I believe what people told me. <laughs> I ain't doing that anymore. <laughs> I done learned my lesson. That's number nine. I can go on from that one. Is, is this good enough for you to come back? It's a good. I'm gonna. I'm giving you the goodies. I, I had this. The Lord gave this to me. The last one is divinity versus humanity. Oh my gosh. He did. Coach Winburn did a thesis. I think it was early this year about divinity versus humanity. I'm here to tell you, probably 99% of all the churches on the planet Earth got that one mixed up. Let me say it again. This is a strong statement. I believe 99% of the churches on the planet Earth got this last principle mixed up. Two weeks ago, I did the contrast between divinity versus humanity. Two weeks ago, I talked about, I, I talked about there is 
what's called a covenant, arrangement between God and man. In that thing, I went through the thesis that lawyers taught me. I had a lawyer sitting in a class I was teaching on, on, on prosperity. They said, Chuck, these are legal terms. And they got me, they sat me down. And I went through a law book and I was like, ooh. I was looking at that face value. Oh, no. The Bible is a legal contract between man and God. Let me give you the backside of it. The backside of it is the only thing that could screw this legal contract up is you. There were places where Jesus couldn't heal folk. Think about what I just said. This is God wrapped in flesh, the maker of everything in the universe. Put the hand on them and couldn't heal them. That's their humanity that got it screwed up. Their humanity had it screwed up, right? There were people, and he went to a town, he was blessing these folks, and he said after leaving that town, he had to get out of that town. He said, the poor will be amongst you always. He had to get up out of Dodge. He said, oh, no. Whoa. He said, the poor will be amongst you always. Divinity versus humanity. The only thing that can screw this thing up is you. Amen? So at this point, I'm going to bring Coach up. Coach, I wanted to give you the best thing I can give you right now which are 10 things that you bless me with by me being a part of this ministry. Thank you so much. God bless you. Well, I greet you all in the name of Jesus Christ and the anointed one and his anointing and appreciate each and all of you all. Give me a little bass, a little tremble and all that and appreciate each and every one of y'all. Uh, one of the things Chuck said, he says, I'm the only person that uh, didn't run him crazy. Well, I'm a little crazy. You just don't know it yet. <laughs> are you all here with me? Well, we appreciate those that are here with us. Uh, in just a moment, hey, let me just get through this, and I want to recognize, hey, how you doing today? Glad to see each and every one of you all. Welcome to the Sunday morning mastermind class. It's really interesting. Technology is so powerful that I had people just texting me, Winburn, I'm just going to watch you. I'm staying home today. I'm going to watch. It's amazing how they do it. Uh, hey, they've been sending their money in. I'm not complaining about it. Are <laughs> you with me? And Barrage, look, they can stay home. They send their money. It's fine with me. But today we appreciate each and every one of you. How are you doing? Glad to see you again. See you. Welcome to the Sunday morning mastermind class. We're going to teach for 45 minutes today, not uh, an hour, because uh, to redeem the times. We'll be back on uh, Sunday. It's actually Sunday, March the uh, 28th. And they're working on the little thing there for a moment. Let's give them a chance. And my mic went out for some reason. I guess it'll come back up with a little tremble. Okay, it did go down. Okay, uh, thank you. So we'll be back on uh, uh, coming next Sunday. Our message is going to be rewriting your story, overcome pride and failure. We're really going to be dealing with pride next week because that is very important. Everybody say, oh, I got pride. Well, there's some good pride. There's very little of it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of my kids and all that. That's the different. We're not talking about that pride. That pride. We're talking about another pride is why uh, we have 100% divorce and separation rate, okay, and why people can, can't get along and why our country is so messed up because of pride. So next week, we're going to be dealing with your pride is making you unhappy, emotionally unhappy, and negative pride is destroying your relationships. Again, thank you, Oda Chuck, for everything, and uh, we'll talk about uh, yesterday, but I really appreciate uh, Chuck, how he's taken what he's learned and he's put it together over the last uh, uh, decade. And I really appreciate that. What a great honor to leave a legacy uh, that people can uh, further the legacy by carrying out the word. Are you all here with me? Negative pride is destroying your relationships. I'm just telling you, that's what's destroying your relationships. A and uh, in negative pride, when one or both persons dis decide they are no longer going to like that person. The relationship is over. I uh, just want to let you know the mic did go down again, up and down. Y'all work with it. It's down again. Okay. Uh, 
we're working with it. They're working with the mic there. So maybe we ought to just keep it there for right now and see how it works. Negative pride is destroying your relationships. Um, it says choose grace over ego. And then when, when pride turns toxic, are y'all with me? Oh, I'm just so proud of America. Well, right now, the pride in America is nothing but toxicity. 85% of the world is negative. America's right in there with us. And then we wonder why our world is so on a spiritual decline. The health is messed up of, the, of our nation. People, mental illness is the highest it's ever been in America. It's because America has become toxic. They, uh, there's no more pride in so-called America where uh, we love each other and honor each other. Those days are over. It's all about everybody now. Everybody get their own now. Are y'all here with me? So when pride becomes, and then it says turn uh, the page on negative pride this Sunday. A- and then so uh, we got a free e-books today, and we're going to get right to it because I want to I see, uh, uh, oh, the Black Summit. Uh, the Black Male Summit, University of Cincinnati. Thank Chuck, and we, it was just wonderful. Chuck talked about it. We're going to give you a copy of that today. So that's going to go out. You get the free speech. What I, the speech we made yesterday, they asked me to even close out. So we appreciate the close out. We were there all day. What a great place, great place to be, the Carl H. Linder, uh, the College of Business, uh, the Carl H. Linder College of Business. I'm telling you, it was phenomenal. Their technology is great. But guess what? We're good, too. <laughs> we got them. Uh, Chuck, we're just right. Actually, we're about equal in the technology. So uh, I was just glad to see that we were able to have some uh, great innovation. Uh, three easy ways to give today. Uh, why are you giving? This is what I'm going to ask you. To, why are you preparing to give? I'm going to ask Linda. Um, Linda uh, uh, showed up today. Again, several people text me. They would come and they said, well, we're not going to be here. So, Linda, come on up. I want you to come on up and be. let the world see you today. Everybody, I talk about Linda Matthews. And then all, so people need to put a face with it. And um, also, Chuck, would you be able to pull our list together to those who are watching? We had a lot of folks there. Well, we're going to watch live. That's fine. Just make sure you use, uh, while you're watching live, make sure you use that, uh, uh, you use, uh, uh, Sunday Connect Circle uh, PayPal right now. While you're watching live, make sure you use Cash App. Will you do that? Linda, come on, uh, stand over here close, Linda. Everybody want to know who Linda is. L- uh, this is one of the most powerful women in Ohio. Let me just tell you who she is. Linda Matthews just got elected in, in, in a 100% white district. Uh, I, let me just tell you, a, a 100%. She won and beat her white counterpart and became the statewide central committee representative. Are you all here with me? Now, I'm telling y'all, in a white, so she, you can't lose with the stuff she used. <laughs> and, and she won. And also, our, our dearest governor, the powerful governor of Ohio, a dear friend of mine, a dear friend of hers, uh, the powerful governor, Mike DeWine, also appointed her to an HBC, H. HBCU. <laughs> uh, since she's also a trustee of HBCU. Can we welcome one of my dearest friends, Linda Matthews, to our congregation today? Can you just greet them? Yes. Just, Good morning, right. Renew. Yeah, Good you. morning, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. I could have never done this without the teachings of 60 Seconds to a Renew Life. Okay. It changed okay. me, and that's why I'm here today. And I worked hard. I'm going to sure. uh, represent our community. Uh, the city of Cincinnati is some outlying uh, suburban. So I'm going to represent you with dignity and respect. And I'm going to make sure everyone knows what's going on in the city of Cincinnati. And, um, and I just thank you for trusting me. Thank you for the donations. Thank you for praying for me. And um, I'm very happy. And thank you, Charlie, well, for all that you do. Well, thank you. Can we thank uh, uh, Linda Matthews? Also, thank you, but we also have with us Crystal. I don't want to put you on the spot, but Crystal's a Democrat. Everybody says thank all my friends are Republican. Crystal, can you just at least come and greet them? Be- Crystal is beautiful, isn't she? And, uh, come on, Crystal, just come on up here. Crystal is one of my dearest Democratic friends, and uh, I'm like, she's allowed to be here. Come on. Well, matter of fact, the majority of the people here are Democrats, right? <laughs> so here's Crystal. I, I talk about Crystal a lot. Crystal is just probably one of the most dynamic people. And what I like about Crystal, she's everywhere. She goes to Republican meetings, independent, and although she's a Democrat, 
she's not one of those who are born, bred, and, and dead Democrats. So y'all with me? She'll go anywhere. She'll come. You'll see her with, with you'll see her with uh, Governor Mike DeWine. Did y'all hear me? You'll see her at any meeting with a U.S. senator or state representative or the late uh, 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 Bridget Kelly, who we all love. Democrat, you all, was a auditor, one of the most beautiful friends that I've had and, and friends to Crystal, just a wonderful person. So Crystal Dandridge, I want you all, uh, just put a face with a face. Y'all don't get a chance to see all these faces. Crystal, you're welcome to Renew Community Church Sunday morning mastermind class. Greet them if you can. I know I'll put you on the spot. Good morning, everyone. Oh, your mic's uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today on this beautiful Sunday in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, we're greeted by so many wonderful people. Again, congratulations to Linda. I'm so proud of you. Oh, yes, Linda. That's you right, Linda. From afar. I've been so proud to watch you climb. That's um, right. And thank you again, Coach Winburn, for your teachings. It is emotional and physical nourishment for our bodies in this complicated world. Um, so I'm just glad everyone showed up today, and I'm glad everyone's listening all across the world. Um, and thank you for um, letting me speak. Beautiful. Can we welcome uh, Crystal Danter? And then you're going to meet other people. Our, our Vice President Oveta is going to have her turn her day. We were going to honor Jennifer uh, today. I got uh, Jennifer, I did get your text, and I understand. Uh, we're going to honor her, uh, uh, Jennifer Porter, again, and others that are in the congregation. They appreciate those that did show up. Y'all know we are not in the church growth. We are in the growing people. Y'all see the difference? Because y'all know, uh, have a lot of folk. Well, y'all know what that's all about. I don't even need to go there. Let's go here. Three easy ways to give. Sunday PayPal. We're going to start teaching here in just one minute. And we're going to give you 40 minutes. I did cut on a little air. If it's too much, just lift your hands. Okay, just lift your hands. And then uh, let me just give you a chance right now. Online PayPal. I can see your hand. Uh, let's give you a chance here. Uh, you could give also Cash App. Uh, that's a way to give. I got away. Here you go. I cut it down. Oh, 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 okay, okay, that's good. We'll leave it right there. Okay, that's beautiful. And uh, everybody take a look at, uh, that's the Cash App. You can give Cash App. And then um, by mail. Is that okay? You can also give by mail. I do want to thank, I want to, uh, uh, Ann Barrage, you're going to get a chance to meet Ann one day. And she's here. And uh, I want to match your contribution. I'm going to match your contribution that you sent in the mail. I'm also going to match. Uh, she sent so much money in, she don't even know she sent it in. <laughs> yeah, just write one with my name on it and just put all the zeros on it. <laughs> but make sure you put a one in front of it and put 12 zeros. <laughs> is that okay? As long as there's a one on there, is that right? Uh, are you Kento Vetta? Oh, okay, okay. Oh, okay, yeah, oh, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, I knew it was a connection. And so uh, I'm going to also match Dolores also. I'm going to match Dolores's also. She just sent that money. I'm going to match that today uh, in our giving. So we really appreciate uh, your giving. And we did get straightened out, Chuck, on my taxes. You all sent thousands of dollars online last year. Guess what happened? Uh, the, ca uh, the cash app people sent me the K99. So that means I would have to pay taxes on all that money. So we got it straightened out. And thanks to Chuck Futel, uh, we was able to straighten that out. Cash App, people love that Cash App. And, and the people that give here, thank you all for all you're giving and all you're doing. And I'm going to spend 45 minutes of teaching. Is that okay, everybody? And we appreciate each and every one of you all and those that uh, wasn't able to come. It's okay. We'll deal with it. You know, as time goes on, we're not in a rush. And again, thank you, Brother Chuck. I wore this yesterday, and I felt I should wear it in honor of uh, uh, Chuck Futel. I'm a, he blessed me today. I'm going to bless him. I'm going to wear this. And I was, got, I was running behind. I got here. Then I had to run back home because I had some notes that I really want to share with you all today that's going to be a blessing to you all today. Can I go on and bless you all today with the word and help you all? Uh, you don't want to be like uh, a lot of folk in the body of Christ. They're forever learning, and they're never able to do anything. 
Have you ever just met these people that just talk, 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 and they can't do anything? And you look at their spiritual life. Their spiritual life is not there. I mean, show me. Apostle Paul said in Corinthians, he says, I, I may not come with great power and all this other stuff, but I come in the power of the Holy Spirit and, and through demonstration. And that word demonstration means exhibit, uh, strut your stuff. Show us what you could do. Show us how well you're doing spiritually. Show us how your health life is doing. Show us your finances. How well are you doing in your finances? How well are you doing in your body? How well are you doing in your love life? How well are you doing in your, your relationship life and your business life? Are you all here with me? So we don't want to be forever learning and, and never able to do anything. Is that right? So uh, welcome to the Sunday morning mastermind class. Uh, we are going to do this. Iris Rowley have asked me, one of our community leaders, she's asked me, uh, they're going, we're going to be sometime in June. This time, Brother Dan, he slept yesterday. We're going to let you because you got that gun on you. Anybody got that blue, they got that blue steel? You got my attention. Uh, you know, uh, they pulled over a guy, Mom Mabley, they pulled over a guy in, in, uh, who was in Georgia, and the guy, the po cop says, what is your name? And he says, uh, my name is Luc Lucille. He said, your name is Lucille. You know that ain't your name. He said, why did you say Lucille? Because of that blue steel that you carried on the side of you. <laughs> that was Mom Mabley back in those days. Did y'all get it? See how it all worked out? And she was very clever and uh, did the whole thing. Uh, but, <laughs> but um, oh, we're going to give out. Uh, Iris Rowley has asked me to train community leaders. And I said, now, if you have the community leaders there, I want the sheriff there. I want, all, I want the police chief. I want all their colonels. I want people from the court, the prosecutors. I want all, every, it has to be 15 different areas, the uh, juvenile court people, professional people. I'm going to train them for you all. I think they are, they're giving me 60 plus 15 is what? Is that, how many minutes is that? 75 minutes, I'm going to run a therapeutic clinic. And I, my goal is to help everybody get healed while they're in the room. And so that they can go back and heal the people that they are leading. Is everybody here with me? So Sunday, uh, welcome to Sunday morning mastermind class. So, uh, welcome to Sunday morning. And everybody will get a copy of this in the training. So your time will come over and each and every one of you all. Uh, it's called the Transformation Awareness Workbook, Train the Master Trainers Workbook. This is what I gave out yesterday. You all will get this. Get your own workbook so those 300 people will have their workbook sponsored by Renew Community Church and Leadership Concepts. I'm paying for half. The church is paying for half, and they will get one of these. Because you are the vice president of the corporation, you get one in advance. So, okay, see what you get when, you, when you're when you the vice president. Uh, you all here with me, so you get the privilege, uh, and everybody will get a copy of that to rewrite their life. So how many of you all ready for the word? And be not conformed to this word. Uh, to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your what? By the renewing of your what, everybody? By the renewing of your mind. I just wanted to make sure I have everything up here as we get started, because like I said, I had to rush back home. I came in, and I had to rush back home, because I, I did have some things that at the last minute, I usually pick up some uh, additional teaching to help us along the way. Are you all here with me? And so uh, we want to share that with you here in just one moment. And uh, so let's get going and be not conformed to this world. Who do we have with us? Today's message, you all, today's message is centering on, uh, yeah, here it is. I think I found what I needed. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're going to be dealing with victimhood for the next 45 minutes. It's going to be a very uh, uh, therapeutic meeting. And it's for you. Uh, who do we have with us as we start teaching already? We appreciate each and every one of you all. Dr. Molly Thompson. We appreciate Lisa Smith today. Dr. Uh, Michelle Graves. Uh, uh, William Kirkland. Uh, 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 Jennifer. Charles and Jennifer Baker. And we understood. We got you, I got your message, Jennifer. I'll get back with you. Thank you. We understand. It's all beautiful. Everything is great. And then uh, uh, Lakeisha Johnson today. Uh, we appreciate Lakeisha Johnson being in the house. And there's other people, Chuck. Please don't miss any, everyone, because there's some people that, uh, 
it, they, they say they put their name of their company. I want to call their name of their company, too. Also, my brother-in-law is back in the house from Atlanta, Georgia. So each and every one of you all, and glad to see you. Thank you. How many of y'all ready for the next 45 minutes? I pray that the Father of glory will give each one of you all the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Many of you all that sit in the auditorium, if you want to comment using your uh, iPhone is fine, too. If you can watch us on the screen live, you could do that, too. Whatever you like to do, just feel comfortable. We have coffee here, Starbucks coffee. Uh, uh, also, uh, Dr. Ovetta, can you just fix me a little bit there? Uh, don't put your fingers or nothing in it. Uh, just put, don't worry about no, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, uh, y- 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 is everybody here? Okay. So, listen to this. Y'all ready? Let's go. 45 minutes. Victimhood. Stop it before it stops you. Stop it before it stops you. Uh, is that pretty good, everybody? Victimhood. Uh, playing the victim, and you'd be surprised. And all of us, l- let me just say something. All of us in our life has played the victim one time or another. Who will be honest and just lift their hands and say, yes, I played the victim? Who is honest enough to do it? I, I, I played the vic- victim before, right? Anybody else have played it? How many? Who else have played the victim before? Yeah, played the, we all have done that, but most people play it all the time. Let's go on. The next one is, if you play the victim, uh, if you play the victim, if you play the role of a victim, you won't be happy. Just bottom line. Bottom line, you won't be happy. And I hear people say, well, I just, all I want to do is serve people and all that. Look, if serving is fine. We want to serve people. But more importantly, you serve people out of happiness. Or, or you, you don't want to serve people to become happy. You want to serve people because you're already happy. Y'all see the difference? The next one is learn how to break victimhood so you can be happy today. We're going to give you some simple principles on how to break victimhood so you can be happy. Sometimes you may think you don't know. You you know, you probably say, well, I don't think I'm a victim. Well, we're going to find out today. Is that right, Dr. Linder? Victimhood leads to emotional happiness. Show me somebody who plays the victim, and I'll show you somebody who's very unhappy. We're teaching right now, everybody. Everybody, the teaching has started. I remember years ago, uh, Dr. Ovetta, we had a group of people who left the church here, yeah, just years ago, years ago, and it was just awful, you all, what these people did. They left, and they met at a friend's, uh, a former friend, and I'm not going to say where, because they may be listening now, but they went to, uh, they left, oh, it was about, 15 of them, and guess what they did? One of my uh, uh, spiritual fathers came to town, and they all met with, uh, met with these 15 people who left this church. Guess what they did, you all? They got over there, and they were all crying. Oh, Charlie Whitburn, he abused us with the word of God. He put us down in the pulpit. We, we felt like we wasn't nothing. Uh, and he favored all the women in the church. He loved only the women. These are the men crying, too. The men over there crying. Oh, he didn't love me. He put all these women up. And we know we don't let women do all that. All the women are second-class citizens. They just went. They played the victim role. And I asked a man in the house who was there. He said, Winburn, it was awful what they did to you. He said it was just awful. And uh, I guess his wife was in on it, too. He, he, he called me and told me quietly. Is everybody here with me? Come on, everybody. Stay, stay, stay focused. Stay focused in my class. Okay, all the kissing. Y'all do that later. They kissing up in here, everybody. But uh, <laughs> God bless everybody. God bless the folk. <laughs> Is everybody here <laughs> with me? So uh, uh, they were crying, you all, because they were playing the victim. And all of their lives are splattered now. All of them are, they all, uh, every last one of them that I know to this day are very unhappy people. And they never got their lives together. That's why I always say, when are you going to become happy? You can't, some people, I'm going to wait to get to heaven. You know nothing about heaven. You barely know about the earth. Oh, when I get to heaven, I'll be happy. You don't know nothing about it. You've never been there. Now, by faith, we've been there. And even at that, the Bible says, for in him we live and move and have our being. 
So victimhood leads to emotional unhappiness. Let's go on, everybody. Get you a few scriptures out of the way. Let's just get through a few scriptures. And then I want to spend some time on relationships here. Oh, here's our scripture. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Is everybody with me? Here's a scripture that we found on victimhood. This is, we came close to it. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go. When you see angry men, and by the way, this is really talking about males here, but this can be generic to everybody. Make no friends. When you see angry people and they get angry, brother, and they're mad and upset all the time, don't make no friends with these people because guess what? You can't trust them. By the way, 85% of the people that's in your life anyway are living in falsehood. They're living in shame. They're living in guilt. Isn't that what we said yesterday, Dr. Chuck? At, at the University of Cincinnati, a college of uh, business, a call in the college of business. Uh, there, uh, uh, it, 85% of the people that you and I know, I hate to tell you all this, basically you have to be careful with the advice they tell you because they're living in falsehood. That means they're carrying low vibrations. They're living in shame. They're living, they're upset. They're mad all the time. They're angry all the time. They're in grief and they're in pride. And what kind of advice can they give you? None. 85%. So that means really ten, every 10 person in your life, ten, uh, at that means 8.5% of the people in your life are, are living in falsehood. And I'm not saying you should go around and don't trust folk. You just don't trust their advice. Did y'all hear what I'm saying? Only 15% of the people probably in your life is walking in truth. Let's go on. Here's one. Every wise woman. Now, you see, I got, I got a scripture on men. Now, you women don't get upset. Here's, here's one on men. I got, a me, I got one for men. Now, y'all jumping and shouting. Jump on this one. Every wise woman, you know, this is a woman that is, well, uh, she's moving into marriage. Uh, she's, uh, uh, she's dating or moving into fellowship or she's married. It says every wise, wo every wise woman buildeth her house, but a foolish woman plucketh it down with her own hands. Uh, so you got to decide if you're a wise woman. And many times you're losing your husbands and you're losing good relationships because you're not being wise. And just like angry men, angry, angry man is more crazy than an a, a unwise woman. But you put them all in the bag together, all of them messed up. Did you all hear what I'm saying? Uh, we went out the other night. Uh, I had a group of people. We all just went out and had fun spontaneously. And, of course, I, uh, I think I was 47 years, old, uh, on, um, 47 years old on Friday evening. Uh, this morning I woke up on the 46. Because every day, that's my body age. Are you all here with me? That's my body age. Uh, but I'm 73 in, in reality. But, uh, but I'm fine. You understand? That's a little pride right there. But that's good pride. Uh, but you, you know that's good pride. <laughs> but we all went out. And we all had fun, everybody. And I was telling the, uh, one of the couples there, look, you all, this is the first time y'all met. And I hooked them up because I told them that I, who I was doing. It really worked out really good. And, and when you meet people, you all, you got to be wise. So you all here with me. And you can't be forming these judgmental things about people until you get to know people. And uh, so it was a great, and why did I bring this up? Because uh, some people every now and then, Winburn, you never, uh, we, I, I don't go, you, why you don't go out with me and we all go out to dinner? Well, first of all, I don't go out with you because you're too darn religious. And not, we can't have no fun with you. I want to go out with people that I can have fun with. Like this man, I want to go out where I can laugh, joke, talk about sex, talk about politics. Uh, look at him, how he's looking. Look, I, I, that's why I don't go out with no uh, preachers. I, no, one thing, I don't go out with preachers. I don't, want, I, I don't go out with preachers and pastors and bishops. I'm not, I can't have no fun with them people. I go out with people that I can have me some fun with. Okay, let's go on. Uh, how did I get there? Casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Uh, rejoicing in hope and, 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 and tribulations. Instant in prayer. And uh, here's one. Oh, now let me read this scripture. It says, the righteous cry. If you're a victim... Now, you could just cry out to the Lord, the righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and, and, and what? Delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are a broken heart. Because if you're a victim, you've got a broken heart. You've got issues that you've got to deal with in your life. 
and uh, and then it says, such as be is a contrite spirit. Uh, so introduction here today. So you want to play the role of a victim. You want to play the role of a victim. I want to talk about relationships in context of the role of victim. Now, remember, everybody today, uh, you can lock that door there, young man. Everybody, to, uh, uh, everybody today um, gets a, uh, get a copy of the e-book on my teaching. And Crystal, thank you for coming up. Thank you for Linda for coming up. And others will come up. Y'all going to know who the great, uh, great wolf is one day. Y'all going to get to know the gray wolf. Okay. Uh, this is the coffee sister. Is this it? Okay. You expect me to put my cream in there too? Okay. Put some cream in there for me, sister. Don't put your fingers in it, okay? Okay. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's amazing, you all. Uh, I was out, and we were all eating, and my guest says, oh, do you want to uh, sample my stuff? I said, nope. Mm -mm. Now, last time. Uh, my aunt sampled something. She's dead. So I don't, <laughs> I don't do no sampling of people's food. Are you all here with me? And I was so kind about it. <laughs> I was so kind. And I'm glad they didn't ask me why. Are you all here with me? So let's go. So you want to play the role of a victim, right? You want to play the role of a victim. And we're going to find out what it's all about. Y'all ready, everybody, to really dig in and go, th go a little further for uh, some healing here today? Let's talk about... Okay, let's, let's get right down to it real quick. Let me make sure, because I really want to make sure at the end, if I don't do anything at the end, I want to make certain that there's one, one teaching that we do get in at the end. Is everybody still with us on, uh, still, uh, here it is. So I'm going to move some things out of the way. Hey, uh, uh, brother, could you get put that on 70? I, I moved it up. I could tell it got a little warm. I'll put it on 70. It's already, uh, don't, don't, don't turn it to just 70. It'll be fine. I think it's at 73. Okay. Now, y'all ready? Let's have a little fun. I'm going to spend a little time, at least 20 minutes on this, and we'll wrap up. I, uh, I'm reading another book. I have another book that a person on my team, and I don't know if I shared it with you, a person on, on, the, on my uh, finance team that I'm working with in business, um, shared a book. It's called, Are You the One for Me? Are You the One? And we're going to talk about relationships for at least 20 minutes. Can we do that? And then we'll wrap up and try to get you some additional uh, ways of how to overcome um, victimhood. But these, uh, I'm going to give you some examples in a moment on what victimhood looks like. How's that? What victimhood looks like. So if we don't finish all the ebook today, you can get it yourself. And read it. It's called here. How many of y'all say it? It's called. Here's the name of the book. It's called, Are You the One for Me? Knowing Who's Right and Avoiding Who's Wrong. Is that pretty good? And I've already heard the video, uh, the audio on it. And it's an old book. This actually, the woman, be, uh, it was the author of the bestseller. Uh, bestseller. Uh, this was in like the 90s. And we were able to get it. Uh, my daughter, Charity, got it all. Over. I don't know how my daughter, Charity, these young people could find stuff. And uh, they found me five copies of it. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, are you the one for me? So all of y'all that's trying to get married again, getting involved with each other, and um, are you the one for me? Uh, because the, uh, the, some of the people that you're going to be dating and I hate to tell you this, the majority of the people you're going to be dating are going to be victims. Uh, already, we already know 85% of the people you're going to be dating, eight out of, out of uh, if you've dated 10 people, already 8.5 of them are living in falsehood. So you already know you, it's a very slim situation. The person that I introduced to this other person on Friday evening, we all went out, uh, we got, they are in the 15% because the woman trusted me to find her somebody that she would like to meet. And I, the guy trusted me with his life to find somebody. I would not introduce him to a woman who's in the 85%. That the woman who's in the 85%, that means she's a woman of falsehood and she's a woman that's got low vibrations and a woman that will bring your vibrations down. Vice versa, I would not introduce he, her 
to a man that is in the 85 percent, a man that I already, uh, are y'all here with me? I wouldn't introduce uh, her to a man that is uh, in falsehood, uh, that's in blame, a man that's walking in victimhood, a man that is walking in falsehood. So uh, the reason why that was a 15 percent situation where they may have an opportunity is because I was able to facilitate that relationship. I don't know how it's going to end up. I don't know where it's going. It's none of my business. When I bring you together, uh, that's all I'm supposed to do. Are y'all here with me? So let's talk about it real quick. Here it is. Here are victim, uh, and I got this here. I, I, I had to run back home and get this because I left some of my notes here. I want to help you all with relationships. Can y'all see me pretty good out there, young man? How, how, are we looking okay out there? Can you see me? We're talking pretty good. You look good with that blue steel on you, brother. That's good. Let's go. Victim, here, I, I, I wrote this. People may hold on to the pain that others cause them from various reasons. Here are 10 possible reasons why victims uh, hold on to stuff. So the people that you are dating, you all remember, I told you about the book. I, what did I do with the book here? Uh, he, I got it right here. Here it is. It says, Are You the One for Me? By, Bar by Dr. Barbara DeAngelis. By Bar Dr. Barbara DeAngelis. Are you the one for me? Uh, knowing who's right and avoiding who's wrong. Already you know you're not going to be dating and fellowshipping a victim. And you are, you're probably going to find that out uh, uh, by telephone. you got to screen them by tele telephone. Not by social media. Anybody could say anything. But you, just, you screen them by telephone. Because by that time, you go, and then you may do a couple Zoom meetings if you're going to do it that with them before you, if you don't know them, you're going to do it. Even, a, a matter of fact, if I were you, I would not be involved in dating, uh, fellowshipping in these days with anybody unless somebody has given a reference. Like the couple that I did the other day. Oveta knows the couple, uh, knows one of them. And she could vouch for him, I vouch for him, I could vouch for her. Because you are really putting your life in danger if you don't get a reference from somebody of, oh, I know I'm giving good wisdom here today. Did y'all hear what I'm saying? You dating somebody online, you are not a, uh, let me just go on and say, fools despise wisdom and instruction. You are a fool. Let me just call you what it is. Yesterday, I was with all the educators and clinical psychologists and all them. I didn't back up because they were educators and philosophers. And all. I, I just was honest with them, too. You are a fool if you go online trying to get a date and marry somebody, and you don't know nothing about these people. And you are a fool. You meet somebody in the bar and take them home with you. You may show, well, I'm going to tell you what happened. These folk now in Atlanta, boy, y'all want to get a, they, they don't be playing. You date somebody in Atlanta, they, your head, you'll find your head in, in Alabama, your feet in Florida, your eyes in Ohio, and we may find your tongue up here at Renew Community Church. So I'm just telling y'all, y'all better really watch all this stuff. Y'all know I'm telling y'all the truth. Y'all keep dating people. You don't know nothing about these people. Let's go on. Here it is. Why is it that victims hold on to pain? Uh, uh, it's because they have a fear of letting go. They have a desire for justice. Do you know there are people that may hold on to the pain as a way of seeking justice or retribution? They may feel that releasing the pain means letting the other person off the hook for their actions. But guess what they do? They end up hurting themselves in the process. That's why most victims are on a spiritual decline a physical de decline, health decline, mental decline, relationship decline, and they're very unhappy people. Our goal here in life while on this earth should really the walk in love, joy, peace, and which is emotional happiness. If you could do that, that's your heaven on earth. And some of you all say, I just got to help all these people to get to heaven. I got to do all this. You're just wasting your, you're stressing yourself out. If you want to help other people, just the walk in love, joy, peace, and happiness, you will help the earth. We all will have a better vibration together. Uh, could you get a uh, volume just to tell you something for me? Uh, uh, if it's, if it's going to be an issue, d d just be real cautious. So here is another reason, you all. That's good. Emotional attachment. Uh, oh, people uh, hold on to uh, 
their pain because of sense of validation. Holding on to the pain caused by others can sometimes provide a sense of validation for the hurt, uh, for the hurt individual. Also, emotional attachment. In some cases, individuals may develop an emotional attachment to the pain. Did y'all hear what I just said? The reason why some people can't let go of victimhood, they may hold on to an emotional attachment of the pain, which is a trauma bond with themselves. Did y'all hear what I just said? Having a trauma bond with yourself. I was telling the guy from Michigan the other day, he was uh, there at UC, and he said, Wimber, I never heard that before. And I told him, really, I never heard it before neither until yesterday until it came out of my mouth. Uh, uh, it's called a trauma bond with yourself. You got, because that means you attach to your own negative emotions and negative vibes and negative feelings that you've got to break yourself. And it's our responsibility is to drive our enemies out of our life. Yes, and who do we have? And we also have other people that's joined us online, and we appreciate, oh, yeah, Rodney Allen's joined us online. He was with us yesterday at the University of Cincinnati. Chris Bullock was with us yesterday from the uh, University of Cincinnati. Here's another reason why victims hold on to their pain. Victims trauma bonds with themselves. Uh, lack of closure, uh, self-protection, guilt and shame. Individuals may hold on to the pain as a form of self-punishment. Do you not know there are so many people that love to punish themselves? They are not happy unless they are unhappy. It, do y'all know any of those people? They are not happy unless they And then there are some that hold on because of control. Everybody say control. And, uh, and there's ten of them. And another one is called the abhorrence of emotions. Um, letting go of pain can be an emotional process that requires facing difficult feelings as grief and betrayal. Then there are people that hold on to their pain because attachment to the past. And what that means is holding on to the pain caused by others can sometimes be a way of holding on to the past and refusing to let go of what once was. There are some people that just cannot let go. Dude, they just cannot let go. You're still running after them. They done left you, and you're still calling them, still running around. They, they done divorced you, and you're still running around the door, looking at knocking them on the door, sending telegrams. Do they still do that? I don't even I think telegrams are out. Text. Oh, they don't. <laughs> and, uh, so that's one. And here's one. Remember the book that we're talking about now? Let's, uh, let me try to get um, – I'm going to lay this over here. Let's talk about – uh, victims, well, we talked about victims. Let's talk about uh, this type of relationship. Uh, in a relationship, we talk about victims now. We want to talk about this one real quick. Here's one. We're dealing with relationships because this is where people struggle a lot. Religious victims in relationships. Uh, uh, it's nothing like being in a relationship with a religious person. It is nothing like, I don't know why you all are so interested in wanting to marry apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and bishops, and elders. That's why I've asked people just call me Charlie Winburn. Those are the, I, and I, please, apostles and pastors, please, I love you all, but you all are the worst people to be married to because uh, you, you're too religious. And, you, and I don't know why y'all, some of y'all sisters feel you've got to have your pastor. Many of them pastors are mean, mean people. Did y'all hear? Uh, and then here I was one coming up as an ordained elder. I had all this resentment. I'm uh, not resentment. I had uh, rejection. I had abandonment in my life. And I had uh, fear in my life. And I didn't know what to call it. I knew something was bothering me. I knew I was irritable. I knew I was hypervigilant. That means on the edge all the time. And I poured all that into my wife that I married. And as a result, whatever she had in her, and I won't tell you what she had, I got all that stuff. So I got her stuff. She got my stuff. I already had my stuff. Then we brought our kids in the world. They got stuff from us. Then they grew up with their friends, and I picked up their stuff. Then I came to the church, and having all the elders and everybody around me, I got their stuff. I'm just nothing but a freaky deaky. And so I had to break all these trauma bonds. Now, here's one. Let's go on. These religious people, you get in a rela relationship, it, it's just better, uh, in a sense, it's almost better to marry a person 
uh, that has not really grew up in the church. Because many times people that have grown up in the church, they grew up in the church, but they never grew up in Christ. Did y'all hear what I'm saying? They grew up in, I want me a church girl. I want me a church boy. You asking for hell, baby. You don't even know what you're asking for. Let me show you what you're asking for, because this is how church people act and how church women act. Most of them, I'm going to say most, and on a date, and church men act on a date. Here it is. It says, certainly, being in a relationship with someone who is dogmatic, demanding, fault-finding, super religious, can be challenging. Here are 20, a uh, uh, little loud in the back, here are 20 reasons why it can be difficult to deal with church women and church men trying to date them. If I was ever free, I want to know, do you go to church often? They say, oh, I go to church every Sunday. Well, don't apply here because it ain't going to work. Because, you uh, uh, yeah, Winburn, you, you wouldn't be looking for a church woman? Mm -mm. No, Lord Jesus. Been there, done that, as y'all call it, right? I'm using y'all's language. Oh, y'all here with me. Oh, better when you do whatever. When y'all do all y'all unmarried women in here, please don't bring nobody to me to officiate your marriage and they, they in church. Did y'all hear what I'm saying? <laughs> please. Uh, are we having fun already, Chuck? Uh, here it is, you all. Here are these religious people. You get in a relationship with them. Here's what they do. They lack flexibility. They're constant. They got constant pressure on you. Demanding partners may constantly expect you to meet their high expectations. And I, I, it's okay in the beginning, you all trying to work out stuff. But once you get in a relationship, and that's why everybody should become a friend to each other before you get married. Y'all need to go to the zoo together. Y'all need to spend time together. You need to have fun together. Y'all need to know each other's strengths and weaknesses. You need to become a friend to someone. But the era that me and Chuck came out of, we just got married pretty much. We wasn't friends to nobody. Yeah, and then they told us, you know, uh, you know, the, we, they used the scripture, it's better to marry than to burn. Coming up in uh, my age, we were burning. I was burning all the time. So you, we, did, we didn't take no time to uh, put out no fires. I mean, you know, the fires we put out, we had to, we had to do a sexual healing. Are you with me? I was more into a sexual healing than I was into trauma. I didn't understand trauma. But with what I know now, whoo, Lord, I would have left the sexual healing with what I know now. Are you with me? That's right. So let's go. So here are 20 reasons why it could be difficult. Uh, these religious people, they lack flexibility. They put you under constant pressure. They're always finding fault criticism. They have limited uh, appearance. Super religious partners may have all these strict rules and beliefs and, and, and all this. I, I remember I was in this situation. Oh, God, oh, years ago, I just couldn't believe what I was hearing from this religious person. Oh, I really, you can't kiss me over there like that. I said, who told you that? Our church says, oh, no, you're going to hell if you do that kind of lovemaking. I said, well, we're already in hell because we can't do that kind of lovemaking. Did y'all hear Crystal? It was awful. Did y'all hear me? Y'all be marrying these folks. Y'all better have a list of stuff before you get married to ask y'all's do's and don'ts. You don't want to wait to get in marri marriage and find out. You can't even look at nobody. Y'all got whatever you do, you got to do it in the dark. Can't look at nothing. Can't see nothing. I'm trying to be nice. Is this going to be okay? Well, I don't have to take this one down, do I? Okay, let's go. Let's go. Okay, let's go. Emotional strain. We're having fun. Y'all know I love to have fun. Uh, 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 you marry somebody who's a, a religious victim, a religious victim. They lack of mutual respect. They're difficult to communicate with. Have you ever just had somebody just... Just, just listen what it says. Difference in beliefs and values can create barriers to effective communication and understanding the relationship. Uh, religious, these religious victims that you get involved with, dating them, uh, they got all this guilt and shame in their life. Uh, they got these judgmental attitudes. Who else we have? Judge, uh, you don't want to be, you want somebody you could be free with, that you could hug with. I'm telling you, Chuck, we got, I, Chuck, I don't know. I don't know if I can take Chuck. I can probably take Chuck. I don't know. But uh, Chuck, you, you, Chuck needs to just come out and witness. Uh, I don't know if I want Chuck to witness this because that's another side of me he hasn't seen. 
But uh, I think Ovetta may be able to handle it. But uh, it, we were out, uh, and, and we had the best time for two and a half hours, you all. A group of us professional people, people with degrees and uh, some with no degree, and we just enjoyed each other. And everybody, it was just a, every, there was no judgment. If somebody said something crazy, nobody bothered it. Nobody put God in it. Nobody started praying. Let's hold hands. Let's speak in tongues. It wasn't none of that stuff. And y'all, I could be very bizarre and graphic, and they just like, oh, Winburn, that's normal for Winburn. And then we, we just, and we got one of our brothers who you know, we, he was just like, it, it was good for him. Everybody uh, text back and said, what a joy to be involved in, in a meeting. It was a joy. Are you all here with me? So we have, oh, Dr. Regina Hutchins. Um, maybe we'll take you out one day, Regina. Now, Regina laugh. I like Regina. She, she, she's raw. She's down to earth. We like Regina. We can take her out. And Janice uh, Robinson, like to meet you one day. God bless you for being with us. So here's these judgmental people who you want to, uh, who are victims. These are religious victims that you don't want to date, you don't want to marry, and you, you really want to be careful with them. They're involved in isolation, conflict escalation, difference in beliefs. They will escalate. Have you ever been with somebody and it start out with a little small thing, next thing it's a, you, and turned into a riot? Uh, isolation, lack of compromise. Have you ever met people? Lack of compromise, unrealistic expectations, emotional manipulation, strain on intimacy, difference in beliefs and values can create a barrier to emotional intimacy and connection in relationships. Now, remember, this book, uh, I, I, I'm kind of, uh, this is really a good book, and uh, I've been listening to the audio. Are you the one for me? I'm helping y'all to dig out, folks. So you won't make mistakes like me and Chuck over the years when we had relationships. I've used Chuck because we're probably, I'm the oldest probably in the room here. And maybe I'll just, uh, Chuck probably want me to leave him out of that. Because, uh, uh, by the way, Marcia don't want me to probably put you in there. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, uh, but nevertheless, let's go back. Uh, emotional manipulation. Unrealistic expectations. You're dating these religious people. Religious people are the hardest folk. They don't have fun, you all. They, and I, I use the zoo. They don't like going to the zoo. They don't like going to the King's Island. They don't like having fun. They just want to read the Bible and pray in tongues all the time. And brother, you got to enjoy life. And a uh, matter of fact, take a year or two uh, before you marry somebody and just have all the fun you can. And it, all the fun, learn about each other, learn about each other's weaknesses, talk about your life without all the stress. And, in, and when you come together, make a pledge. Hey, we're, today we're going to be together. We wait, uh, we're, gonna, we're just going to enjoy each other and just have fun, joy, and peace. Make a pledge every day. That's how would, how would y'all like to have a partner where you can wake up every day and say, our pledge is today we're going to have, no matter what, mutual fun, joy, and peace and happiness. How many couples in America do that? None. None. Do you do that? Oh, okay. Dan said he did. He said he did. Oh, okay. That's right. One in ten. Very few couples wake up every day saying, let's have some fun. Let's have fun. And let's, have, let's even pray to have love, joy, peace, and happiness. And uh, e every day when I get up, and I did it today, I was out on the porch, Chuck. Chuck, just do it. They're going to think you're crazy, but that's okay. Um, uh, so I get out on the porch. I lift my hands. I said it's my divine and human right to feel good today. And my hands up. People seeing me. And uh, it's my divine and human right to be happy today, to have fun today. I want to love the Lord thy God with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength. I want to love my uh, neighbor as myself. And it's my divine and human right to walk in spiritual happiness, physical health today. And then I start calling out my different organs. And I said, and even today I drove out of my life again. I said, it's my divine and human right to drive out of my life any uh, uh, unmet needs, unhealed hurts unresolved issues, childhood trauma, childhood drama. It's my divine and human right to, uh, to drive out of my life oxidative stress, uh, unnecessary inflammation, and toxicity in my life as a result of unresolved issues and childhood trauma. Are you all here with me? Let's get back to it, you all. Can you all see me pretty good here? 
Here's another one. Maybe I'll do this. Here's one. Uh, these religious, we're talking about religious people. Uh, are you the one for me? Uh, religious people, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just telling you. Religious people are the most difficult people to be married to. And they are really, really, and we ain't talking about being spiritual. We're talking about religious. Uh, you all here with me. Uh, emotional manipulation, strain on intimacy, insecurity, constant criticism and pressure from a dogma, a fault-finding partner can lead to feelings of insecurity, loss of individuality, loss of individuality. Being in a relationship with a controlling and demanding partner can result in the loss of your own identity if you don't be careful a lack of personal growth, and emotional abuse. And let me just tell you right now, we are in a society where men and women are abusing each other in dating relationships and fellowship. And I want to tell you right now, it is equal. Women and men in America and all over this world, the abuse is about equal wherever you go on emotional abuse. It used to be men. Uh, it used to be a men abusing all these women. Now it's both ways. It's caught up. Now, w more women... Uh, report domestic violence and physical violence. That number is still there. But men get their butt beat too. And and they experience, men though, uh, uh, although on physical uh, violence, um, uh, women uh, report that more than men. But 80% of men, the most of the men I know will tell you, their wives emotionally abuse them. Talk down to them, have no reverence for them, tell them you ain't nothing, you are, you are small, and y'all know what that means. Tell them, oh, you small, you ain't no good in the bed, we don't reverence you, you ain't all that. Uh, you know, and you, if you want to kill a man, you just tell him all that stuff. And I guarantee you, he is not going to, number one, treat you right. The next thing you know, he's gone. If, uh, uh, then you're going to wonder why, why my man cheating on me? Well, you already told him he ain't no good. You told him he all messed up. You told him he's not endowed. You, you already messed him up. You already didn't reverence him at all. Did y'all hear what I'm saying? That's emotional abuse. And all of it is wrong. It, you, nobody ought to be putting their hands on a woman. Or no woman ought to be putting her mouth on a man when it comes to emotional abuse. Uh, you all, were, uh, you all here, you're here with me. I told him, oh, by the way, I told him yesterday, Chuck was there, and we're going to go to the PowerPoint. I'm going to try to wrap up here uh, in a moment. I got a, one more here. Uh, but I told him yesterday, listen to this. And I didn't even see this until actually yesterday. I was telling uh, these educators and clinical psychologists and philosophers and different professors at the university and being able to uh, uh, business people. I didn't notice this. I was in the foster homes. Uh, 17 of them. Well, one of them was Allen House. It would, it's really not a foster home, but I was in Allen House. But when I look back, what happened, I, I, uh, what happened, uh, all of the men in the home, all the foster dads were very docile men. They were very docile men, and the women in the home ruled them, told them what to do, talked down to them. I never paid a a lot of attention to it, but I, I, I didn't know what it was all about. And I would even ask some of the one foster dad, you let her talk to you like that? Because I didn't understand how relationships and marriage work. So all I had was that a man in the house better keep his mouth shut, and he better do what he's told to do. So I came out of that environment. Every foster home that I got kicked out of the foster home, all 16 of them, all 16 women kicked me out because I wouldn't go for that. I just could not go for that. I didn't understand it. They called me an MF. I called them an MF. Uh, they, they gave me the finger. I ain't going to show you the finger. I gave them the finger. I just didn't understand it because I just could not do uh, take what those guys were taking. And I was like 12, 13, 14, and 15, you all, and 16. But it was for some reason I had this resistance against that kind of domination by anybody. I, I, it's just so unfortunate that these women were dominating these guys. And all of these guys were weak, you all. All of my foster dads were weak. They did. They took the instructions from the wives, and, and the wives told them, go here, go there. And I didn't understand it. I thought that was, I really didn't get it. But I didn't like it, so I resisted it. 
And I, that's why I found myself in all them different foster homes. But I didn't know it until yesterday that I had an issue around, not an issue taking uh, orders from a woman because all of my supervisors in life have been women. And I've honored them and respected them. But I didn't know that's why I got kicked out of the foster home. And that's why I said yesterday, and the men got real quiet when I said, I don't have a problem with a strong woman. I got a problem with weak men. Because I got that from the foster homes coming up with all them weak behind men that was afraid to stand up and talk to their wife with love and honor instead of them being a man and standing up and being kind to their wife and saying, hey, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to. And the women was telling them what to do and then dishonoring them and telling them, you ain't this. You ain't no good. You're this. You ain't no good in bed. I heard all this stuff in the foster homes. And that's the image that I had of the kind of women that I came out from. So when I got in relationship, I thought all women were like that. Well, all of them weren't like that, but they were pretty much close to it. Give me a little air over there, will you? <laughs> no, really, that's, I'm going to be honest. That's what was going on because that was my orientation because that's all I had. And I grew up in false homes, and all 16 women kicked my butt kick my butt out. I could use butt, right? Some of y'all so religious, I can't even say butt. But I'm going to say butt. They kicked my butt out of the house. And then when we got in the church, they tried to do the same thing. And I just wouldn't do it. It's not that I wouldn't take any instructions from a, wo a woman because I was able to do it on my job. All my dynamic women, Dr. Minnie Phil Johnson, who died last this year, uh, I reported to her, one of the greatest dynamic women I ever worked for, Miss Mildred Ross at the Cincinnati Public Schools. I reported to her every day. She loved me and honored me and promoted me. All the women, I, I worked for dynamic women. They were not like that. But the women that I saw in the foster home and the women that I worked for was a, a, a 300, 180 degree different type of woman. Is everybody here with me? And I love women. I think women are great, and they are, they're wonderful, and they're great people. But I didn't have a good uh, foundation for what a woman w was to be. Now, I had a great mother. My mother never put me down. She honored me. She loved me. She even called me brother. That was my nickname is brother in the family. Hey, brother. She loved me and honored me. She's one of the sweetest women I've ever had. Now, I'm going to tell you this. She carried a pistol. Uh, with a, a, a long pistol because what happened do, while my father was a horse trainer she had this big gun there and I knew where she kept it and guess what anybody mess with my mother I knew where the gun was I would go in there and blow your I would shoot you you know back in those days and I was only eight nine years old but I knew where she kept that gun and she had the gun there to protect us because my father was a horse trainer and he was out of town how did I get there here's eight more eight, eight reasons why it's hard uh, for victims to forgive. Uh, uh, why these uh, victims, uh, they believe a betrayal of trust, emotional attachment, a sense of injustice. Many of them fear vulnerability. They have pride and ego, lingering pain, lack of remorse, revenge uh, fantasies. Are you all aware? Uh, it, what is revenge fantasy? It's thoughts of revenge and retribution can make it difficult to forgive. The desire for justice to see the other person suffer can keep you locked in, can keep you locked in to uh, unresolved childhood trauma. Are you all with me? Now, let's go here. See if we could wrap up 10 minutes. Is this okay, everybody? I want to tell you, as you go out here, uh, are you the one for me? You've got to make sure you're not dating victims. And you're not dating victims. Um, won't y'all say, I look at somebody, y'all say, I got to make sure that I'm not dating the victim. Say it again. I'm not, I want to make sure that I'm not dating the victim. Can y'all say it again? I want to make sure that I'm not dating the victim. Say it again. I want to make sure that I'm not dating the victim. So you got to make sure, because if you date, if you date a victim, they are the worst people to live with. They're the worst people to get along with. Because most people play the victim. Matter of fact, look at some of our politicians. Let's go. So, so why do people look at our politicians who's billionaires and got money and playing the victim? Okay, let's go. Why do people play the victim? Let's go on. Here it is, unresolved. This is going to be fast, 10 minutes. 
Is everybody real quick now? This is going to be intense. You with me? This is where you get your healing. You get your healing. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hearing it over and over and over and over and over and over. Everybody knows I repackage my message. Is that right, Asia? Over and over and over and over. You'll never miss anything. You miss one Sunday here, you're going to get it over and over again. You ain't going to miss nothing. Because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Let's go back here. Now, 10 minutes. This is going to be the fastest 10 minutes of your life. Why do people play the victim? Ready? One, unresolved childhood trauma. Unmet needs, unhealed hurts, unresolved issues, seeking attention, low self-esteem, past trauma, learned behavior, manipulation, and control. I do want to tell you all this, though. I could be honest and transparent. I would say if I ever had an issue in uh, my first marriage and second marriage, it's been that issue of foster care. And I, I just refuse. There's something in me that just would not allow. Um, uh, it's just... Uh, it wasn't, I, I wouldn't even allow a man to do me like that. No, I couldn't. I had a foster dad. One, I did have one foster dad that um, uh, he wanted, he actually beat me with an ironing card. But he was weak. He was really weak. The foster mother ruled everything, but the foster dad spent his time uh, spanking me and beating me. Are you all here? And I had a friend of mine beat him up. Are you all here with me? And then uh, everybody said, well, who, how did he get beat up? And I, back in those days, I should have said, well, God beat him up. God, God beat him up. You know, I believe it, <laughs> could have blamed it on God. But, but that guy, though, he was a weak guy. The foster mother was strong. But the, the guy, he would take out, because his wife would jump on his behind, he would take out his stuff on me. And then when I got in my marriage, as you all, my uh, first and second, and then I saw the same stuff, you all, I resisted that. I'm sorry. I'm not going to let you do me like that. I'm going to leave. Then you got to go. Bye. I've got the gift of goodbye. See, when I got delivered here uh, in the last 10 years over abandonment, you leaving me, because people use that against me. I've had my spouses and Others and friends and family, they've used this against me because they knew I loved them and I didn't want them to leave me. Uh, are y'all here with me? Or abandon me? Or reject me? And they used it against me. I'm going to leave you. I'm going to let you go. Bye! In Jesus' name. And I may have gone too far now. Bye! And I hope I never see you again. I got the gift of goodbye. And y'all got to get to this way because people love to manipulate you. And they love to do this. So here's what it is. Why do people play the victim? Because of unresolved childhood trauma, past trauma, learned behavior, manipulation and control, lack of coping skills, fear of failure. Once y'all say fail, fear of failure, uh, negative worldview, focus on their past to get attention, uh, low emotional intelligence, lack of self-awareness, uh, inability to control and manage their emotions, a lack of self-discipline, and, and poor relationship management. What are the types of people in your life who play the victim? Who are these types of people? They're attention seekers. Have you ever seen the martyr complex people? Uh, they want to be the martyr. The manipulator, the helpless, the emotional vampires. These vampires who drain your energy. Listening to all this stuff. That's why I don't do counseling no more. I will refuse to set up and listen to somebody for one hour, rehearse their same old mess. And I, my heart goes out to the clinical psychologist and the psychologist and the psychiatrists and counselors and pastors that's got to set up and listen to your mess over and over and year after year and year after year. And then you wonder why your psychiatrist and your psychologist kill themselves. Because the Bible says, take heed what you hear. Take heed what you hear. And you've been in counseling for six months and a year, and your life has not changed. Then you are a person that's not willing to change. You've been in counseling for three years and four years and five years. You are a person that will never change. And you, all you're doing is well, uh, your money. I guess the counselor, if I was a counselor, I would sit there Guess what? Bring me a book to counseling, put some earphones on, and let yourself talk. You talk all you want, and I'll just get your money and get my insurance money. Because, baby, I'm not going to sit there and listen to that mess no more. I don't do counseling no more. 
I can spend three minutes with you and pretty much locate your problem and give you your solution, at least help you with that. But here's what it is, helpless. These emotional vampires drain counseling. Our counseling, uh, let, uh, let talk to most counselors. Talk to a lot of psychiatrists. Talk to a lot of people that's in this ministry and bishops and elders. Chuck, you know I'm, I'm telling you. They are drink their own alcohol. They're on, addicted to sex. Many of the counselors, my heart goes out to every psychologist, every counselor, every pastor, and every bishop that is trying to minister to people one-on-one -on -one and listening to their mess they are nothing but emotional vampires and after six months and a year they are not healed you need to dump them people now I know this is cold you gotta everybody gotta do now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen we got to stop being forever learning and never able to do nothing. You've been in counseling for six months and your life ain't no better than that. You are not serious about your life. Oh, I'm talking here today. These perpetual victims always seeing themselves as being mistreated by some, someone. Self-saboteurs undermine their success and well-being. Who are these people? They're victim mentality. Uh, they are blame shifters. They're Joe drama. It's nothing like a darn drama king and a drama queen. Have y'all met them? Oh, my God. These drama kings. Is everybody still here with me? Everybody playing the victim now. Drama king come in a store, tear up a store. I remember when I used to work at McDonald's. This drama king came in. So, uh, look, it, it was, and I, I tried to give, no, but the person who he was working with uh, uh, mis gave him the wrong amount of money. This drama king put his hand on the hip, tore up, almost tore up our store up on Macmillan, McDonald's. They had to call the police, shut down the place. We had 1,000 people in line because the game was over at, at, at the Bearcats game. Because we, uh, that used to be a, a McDonald's that I worked there. And this drama king came in. And one drama king tore up the whole place. And when I see the drama king coming, I run. Ooh, oh, Lord. I would run. Because he was, oh, brother. He, just one drama king. Do y'all have any of them people in your family? These drama kings, drama kings. Brother, they will exhaust. Run as fast as you can. Gas lighters, the, their goal is to make you look like you're a fool, questioning your perceptions. I, I was, my kids was doing that for a while. I didn't know what it was. I kept feeling. I said, why am I feeling like I went and looked it up. I said, these Negroes are gaslighting me. They were, Dad, Daddy, you need help. Uh, uh, look at that, telling me I need help. Did you hear me? I look like a, a fool. I can't curse no more, I promise. One of the daughters of the Lord, I, I wouldn't, I don't call it cursing. I just like to use colorful words. I don't, I don't curse. I know some curses. Did y'all hear me? But, um, okay, let's go on. Passive aggressive people, y'all met those? All of the men that I grew up in the foster home were like this. Yes, ma'am. Going around there telling their wife, yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Oh, Jesus. I said, Lord, if I could just get on my own one day. And let me tell you, when they told me, that they had a place for me. I was 19 years old, first year in college, and they said, oh, Winburn, you got, you could stay in this dormitory for the next four years at Friars. Oh, when I got my room, y'all, I slept for weeks after week. I said, Lord, I'm so glad to get out of the home of all these drama kings and drama queens, and I've never looked back. It was awful, you all living with these passive-aggressive men. These were some weak men. Y'all know I do want to use a colorful word, but I promised one of the daughters of the Lord I wouldn't use it. But I want the daughter to know I want to use that word. And, uh, I, and I'm not interested in what Jesus would think about it because you know why? I'm a human being. You know, Jesus has to live his life. I thank God. My divinity is, uh, is intact. My God has given me my own humanity. Everybody want to know, what's Jesus saying? I don't want to know what Jesus saying. Let me talk about what I think today. I know what Jesus said in his word. I obey what Jesus said. But everybody don't know what Jesus would think. Jesus went in the temple and whipped some heads. Did y'all remember that? 
He wanted that. You wanted to do all wind burn. You can't whip no heads. Let me come in here one Sunday and whip some heads and behinds and see what you are say. Then I'm going to say, well, what did Jesus say? Well, Jesus whipped some behind. Well, oh, wind burn. I can't argue with you that. You nailed me with the word. Y'all need to stop thinking for Jesus. You don't know what Jesus would think. Okay, let's go on. Ten definitions of a person who plays the victim. Come on. Here it is. Mortar, mentality. Uh, these, uh, here's the people. Uh, they, they call external, uh, 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 sorry, they habitually blame external factors on everything. Tension seekers. Come on. Manipulators. Uh, oh, here's the people who believe they are an eternal victim. That they go to spend the rest of their lives being a victim. The person sees themselves as eternally victimized, and they refuse to acknowledge any positive aspects, and you can't do enough to bless them. I've written checks to people. I've helped help people buy homes. They still ain't happy. I've done stuff for folk. They still ain't happy. I kissed them, kissed their feet, hugged them, and did all kind of stuff. I ain't going to tell you what else. Uh, they still ain't happy. Oh, you all here with me. Oh, I had an aunt. She ain't living now. Now, my uh, uh, aunt, uh, my my sister's probably listening to me. I had an aunt Meryl Lee. That's another one. Uh, I uh, when I used to go on the farm, I was in college. I had an aunt. Uh, is it aunt? I aunt. They uh, it's no. They do pronounce it right. Aunt. So I had this aunt and aunt Meryl Lee, and you know she didn't like me neither. I said, what's wrong with all these women that don't like me? Well, they all had the same spirit of the people that in the foster home. And then when I would arrive, uh, when I would take my college break from UC and arrive down on the farm with my sisters and brothers, guess what she would say when I walk in the door, Chuck? When you're leaving. Now, I just walked in. And then she accused me of practicing voodoo. So I, I played with that because my grandmother used to play with stuff, and they, they said she would played a uh, little, uh, did a little Alabama voodoo. I don't know. Uh, I saw it mix up something, but it wasn't much to me. And uh, she asked me to, she said, uh, brother, can I throw, you got some names of people you want to throw in this stuff? I didn't know what it was. So my aunt thought that I practiced voodoo because she had a problem with her legs. She went and told people I put something on her. So I used to, so she said, yeah, you put something on me. I said, yes, I did. I put something. If you keep messing with me, I'm going to get the other leg. You don't blame me for voodoo for one leg. I'm going to voodoo you on the next leg. And then this aunt had this problem with me. Oh, and then I went to stay with a woman, Mrs. King, and went, I stayed on her farm. A woman, uh, uh, she took me in. I stayed with Mrs. King. She was a nice woman. Do you know my aunt went over there, aunt, I'm going to call her an aunt. My aunt went over there, told her, get him out of your house because he practiced voodoo. Do you not know that woman threw me out of her house? Now, y'all got to remember now. Now, I'm in college now. Now, I'm about, not, about 20 years old. Y'all see what I had to deal with? Now, y'all see why high-valued man, I got to watch everything I do now. A after everybody else get out of my life, if I start all over again, y'all see what I'm about to do. Now y'all see what I have to deal with, why religious women would not be, I wouldn't be attracted to them, and they wouldn't be attracted to me. People that go to, uh, you know, if you've been raised in the church, you're not for me. If you've been raised in, the, in Christ, that's a, different th that's a different story. Let's go on. Okay, how did I get that? <laughs> oh, morally high ground people, I'm not going into that. Uh, avoiding of responsibility. People play the victim. You can never nail them down. They never take responsibility. Here's one, chronic complainers. Y'all ever seen this? I got friends in my inner circle. Con chronic complainers. Let's go on. Professional victims. Just a professional. This individual has mastered the art of playing the victim role to manipulate situations in their favor. Next one, self-victimizing. Uh, Let's go on. 20 reasons why people pay the victim. We don't have to go through all that. Here it is. Uh, uh, here it says, 20 reasons why Playing the victim is not a good thing. Guess what you end up with? Stagnation in your life, poor self-esteem, uh, uh, limited problem solving. Look at it. Uh, financial dependency, reduced motivation, lack of trust, financial instability, and diminished joy and fulfillment. Show me a victim and I'll show you a very unhappy person. And then they'll call you on the phone and tell you all kind of stuff. 
get you involved. Anybody that gossip and run other people down, they are a victim, and they are very unhappy per people. And high-value men do not want to marry men that women that run their mouth, or vice versa, or, women, or men that run their mouth, or women that run their mouth. Are you all here with me? Is this pretty good, everybody? Well, y'all, here's 20 benefits of stopping the role of a victim. Here's benefits. It improve your self-esteem. Once you say improve my self-esteem, uh, I have a better mental health, uh, uh, enhanced problem solving. Let's go on. A better physical health, better financial stability, uh, improved decision making, enhanced leadership skills, uh, increased sense of purpose. Now, I want to show y'all this. Here it is, you all. Finally, here's the solutions. Here's the 20 solutions. Y'all ready? I'm going to hit these. It's going to take two minutes. Here it is. Here's some solutions to actually overcoming victimhood. Be self-aware that you are a victim. That's the first story. Admit I'm a victim. Then I'm going to seek professional help. Two, I'm going to practice self-care now. I'm going to challenge my negative talk. I'm going to set boundaries. I'm going to stop doing it. I'm going to take responsibility. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to practice gratitude. I'm going to pray. Number th uh, eight, I'm going to practice forgiveness. Number uh, nine, I'm going to empower. I'm going to empower myself. I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to start being loving and kind. Number eight, I'm going to build a support network. Are you all here with me? I'm going to surround myself with people who are victors, not victims. People who are encouraging. And when you go out, you're not gossiping about other people. When I went out the other night for two and a half hours, almost three hours, it was nothing. We, it was fun. And I made sure at the table, Chuck, we were going to talk about sex. I made sure that was going. And they said, we expect Winburn to bring up lovemaking because we like that ourselves, too. Isn't that amazing? Everybody that was there, they were into it, too. Are you all here with me? And I teased them. I said, ain't no group coming up in there. We ain't doing no group. Did y'all hear what I'm saying? That ain't coming up in here. Uh, get these hints behind me. Okay. Are y'all ready? Here's one. 11, encourage hobbies and interests. 12, practice mindfulness. These are ways, uh, Avetta, how we overcome being a victim. Next one, educate yourself about what is a victim. Celebrate small victories. Just be, uh, did you, here's one. 15, visualize success. Engage in positive affirmations. Anybody else that we have that I need to recognize before I leave, Chuck? Uh, practice resilience. Focus on personal growth. Express yourself. See, a lot of uh, uh, victims, they only express themselves through mad and mean and just uh, uh, angry, anger. And then finally, stay committed. Breaking free from being a victim mentality is a journey that requires patience and persistence stay committed to your growth and healing process and be kind to yourself along the way now are you the one for me this is the book are you the one for me knowing who's right and avoiding who's wrong so before spend a, a couple years before you get married and uh, have fun and 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 get help get you a good clinical psychologist uh, for five years. Y'all go there for three to six months and try to work through your stuff. Are y'all here with me? That I may give up, may give you a year there after that. If you haven't got your life together by a year, don't get married. You're wasting your time. Did y'all hear what I'm saying? And if y'all, those who's listening to me, I'm for counseling. Please don't go out and say he's against counseling. No, I'm for it. But if you've been in counseling for six months, a year, six years, 10 years, and you're no better than the way you are, you got a problem. Did y'all hear what I'm saying? And I asked one guy one day, he says, he said, I don't believe in a God. And I said, well, who created you? He said, I did. I said, well, you, you didn't do good with yourself. You need to do a, a makeup and a redo because uh, you know, God did create you. Uh, you look a mess. So you all here with me. So do a redo. <laughs> God is good. Let's go on, y'all. I'm through, y'all. Are we having fun already? We're going. Asia, you ready? Let's go. Hey, if you want to give here, 
Thank you all. Oh, there's Dr. John Thomas. Oh, there it is. Uh, but that's fine. Dr. John Thomas is available. Uh, victims just can't be happy. We dealt with that. Three easy ways to give. I hope y'all can be happy today. Can y'all deal with this today? I'm telling you, if you're a victim, don't nobody want to be bothered with you. No, I mean, no high-value person. You know, any, you know, you can go get the 85%. We'd love to have you. That means 85% of the world's in falsehood. 85% of the world's unhappy. There's a lot. You can get married out of the 85%. But you want to get married with the 15% like people like me in our area? Uh-uh. We, uh-uh. we ain't married. No victims. And anybody that uh, has unmet needs, unhealed hurts, unresolved issues, and childhood trauma don't need to apply to the 15% of the women or the men. And I'm telling you all, if y'all think about getting married, you better become the 15%. Because if not, you're going to end up with the tw- uh, 85% person. Are y'all here with me? Well, God is good. Oh, right there. Oh, online PayPal. There it is. And I'm going to match today. And Baraj, I'm going to add uh, Delois. I'm going to match our money today, tithes and offering. Thank you all for giving. Everybody's been today. Anybody did we miss before we go off the air? Because sometimes people text me, Chuck, that uh, I didn't mention their name because they were on. And how did I forget them? And by mail, if you want to give by mail. Hey, thank you all. Today has been an unusual mastermind class. And I just pray. And next week we'll deal with pride. Why pride? You don't want to marry somebody that's got pride. And let, now, w- watch what I'm saying. When, well, there's positive pride. Positive pride is different. But we're talking about pride because if you marry somebody that's got pride, they will never forgive you when you make a mistake because they will never humble themselves and say, I'm sorry. They are the worst per- person to live with. Oh, we got more people to join us today. Rodney Allen, okay. And Dr. Kim Ingram, she's got a group of people over there watching us right now at our house. All of those people, God bless you. Send some money in. Just don't listen to this good word, and, and don't send no money in. Okay, and, and be a blessing. What y'all say, man? Well, we're getting ready to go off the air, everybody. We'll see you next week. We're going to help you deal with your pride next week. Some of y'all don't know you got your pride full, and you don't know why. That's why it's keeping you from your job. That's why your spiritual life, you're not doing well in your spiritual life, your health, your mind, your money, and your, especially in your relationships. The reason why your relationships are a mess and they are nasty and they are falling apart and your husband's cheating on you and your wife's cheating on you and things are not working out in your relationship because you are a man and woman of pride. And that's why nobody wants to be around you. Join me next week and let me show you how to get people around you. God bless you. And may the Lord God bless you real good until we meet again. I am Charlie Winburn, your life coach with Renew Community Church right here in the city of Cincinnati. And I wish above all things that you prosper and be in good health even as your soul prospers. Did you know that you are both human and divine and that you deserve to live a better life in Christ right here on earth? Our messages are practical, they are raw, they are fun, and they are focused on real issues as it relates to your spiritual life, health life, your mental life, your financial life, your relationship life, and even your business life and community life. Today, we have another real life application message designed especially for you and your family. Remember, before we get started today, you can learn more about Renew Community Church Free Life Coaching by visiting our website, renewcommunitychurch.org, or you can listen to us every Sunday at 11.45 a.m. each Sunday on YouTube, Renew Community Church live stream, or reach me at 513-884-7832. I want you to join me now for another life-changing message with Charlie Winburn, your life coach, right here in the city of Cincinnati, Cincinnati, Ohio.